Hi everyone, my name is Elaine and I'm an undergrad student at MIT and visiting MLK scholar and renowned author, Dr. Moya Bailey's Black Feminist Health Science Symposium class. It is my pleasure to welcome you all to the first BFHSS Symposium, where we will be hearing from a plethora of academics and healthcare professionals who will be discussing the need to integrate Black feminism into science, medicine, technology, and health. The American medical system has continually demonstrated its sexist and racist foundations. There is exploitation and abuses towards black and brown people, particularly black women. The most marginalized and vulnerable demographic has historically been black women. Spotlighting their voices and experiences regarding health along with other marginalized groups is necessary if we want to move towards a system whose focus is the people's health. Part one of the symposium entitled Fertile Fields will run from 1 to 2.30 p.m. Eastern time. These presenters work in the tradition of previously established literature. From 2.30 to 3 p.m., there will be a short break and we will come back at 3 p.m. for part two of the symposium, where we will showcase student podcasts on top topics relevant to BFHSS. Part three, entitled Radical Roots, and the final part of the symposium will take place from 4 to 5.30 p.m. Radical Roots features those who inspired the collective and are well established within the discipline of Black feminist health. Captioning can be enabled by simply clicking on the CC icon located on the lower right portion of your player window. We also have an American Sign Language interpreter located on the right side of your video window. If you would like to submit a question or comment, you're welcome to do so using the window just below your video there. Please note, if you're in private or incognito mode on your browser, you will need to enable cookies to do so. Using the questions feature, attendees can use their smartphones or computers to send their questions to Slido and easily upload the best ones. Be sure to follow us on social media. Our Instagram is Black Feminist Health, our Twitter is Black Feminist HS, and Tumblr is BFHSS. We will be live tweeting updates from the event. Before we begin, we would like to take a moment to mourn the loss of the eight lives taken on Tuesday six of whom were Asian women working at massage parlors. Though the racial and gendered motive is clear, the police and media have been upholding white supremacy and protecting the murderer. Excusing his actions by blaming it on a bad day erases the victim's lives. Tr treating race and gender as mutually exclusive erases the victim's lives. Anti-Asian hate is not new and targets our most vulnerable people. As we move through today's events, I hope we all keep in mind who BFHSS stands for and use their voices and experiences to guide our work. We would also like to acknowledge the land on which MIT sits, which is the traditional unceded territory of the Wampanoag Nation and honor indigenous peoples as the traditional stewards of the land. We acknowledge the painful history of genocide and forced occupation of their territory. And we honor and respect the many diverse indigenous people connected to this land on which we gather from time immemorial. Now, it is my honor to introduce Dr. Whitney Peoples as the host to the Fertile Fields segment of the symposium. Dr. Whitney Peoples is a feminist scholar, facilitator, and faculty developer in the Center for Research on Learning and Teaching at the University of Michigan, where she serves as a director of DEI initiatives and critical race pedagogies. She is a co-founder of BFHSS and a leading scholar at the forefront of Black Feminist Health Science Studies. You can read her full bio in the chat. Please take it away, Dr. Peoples. Thank you so much, Elaine. I am very excited about today, excited to spend time um, with these five folks that we're gonna hear from and to spend time with the folks who are watching when we move to Q&A. So I'd like to share just some brief introductions of the panelists, and then we will move uh, into a set of questions and we'll walk through those questions and hear some, I think, really great generative answers and then open up a space for Q&A. Um, the order in which I'll move through these introductions will also be the order in which we will move through the panelists as we talk about these questions. So, um, and I'm gonna just share names and um, titles and institutions, but full bios will be also available in the chat. So first I'd like to introduce Dr. Moya Bailey. Moya Bailey is an assistant professor of Africana and Women's and Gender and Sexuality Studies at Northeastern University. Hi, Dr. Bailey. I'd like to introduce Dr. Omi Sheree Dryden. Dr. Dryden is an associate professor, faculty of medicine at Dalhousie University. I would also like to introduce Dr. Ugo Edu, 
who's an assistant professor in the Department of African American Studies at UCLA. Dr. Adeola Oni Orison is an MD and a PhD resident in family medicine at the University of California. And Dr. Nicole Charles is an assistant professor in women, gender and studies at the University of Toronto, Mississauga. So thank you all so much for being here. I'm very, very excited to move into our conversation. I think the right place to start uh, this conversation is to really ask each of you to talk a little bit about what Black Feminist Health Science Studies is to you and how your own scholarship or practice connects to Black Feminist Health Science Studies or reflects it. Um, and so we'll start with you, Moya. Thank you so much, Dr. Peoples. It's really a pleasure to be here with all of you. And one of the reasons I started thinking about Black Feminist Health Science Studies was my own dissertation research and looking at how Black women were represented in this moment, right when medical education gets standardized. So we're looking at 1910, right after the Flexner Report is published, which standardizes medical education in both the United States and Canada. And at this moment, we see medical students moving towards, moving away from an apprenticeship model to one where they are doing their, learning their medical practice within institutions. And in that process, the idea of who a medical student is and who a uh, medical patient is become really concretized. And it was interesting to me to see that it was both uh, black women who were primarily portrayed in a way that actually mimicked some of the ways that black women were portrayed at the time that I was writing my dissertation. So in this moment of the 1910s after Flexner's report, I'm seeing these stereotypes about black women that I'm also seeing contemporarily. And that just really really struck me that not so much has changed in nearly a century. And I wanted to get at, you know, what is it about Black feminism, uh, Black, the way that Black feminism could perhaps intervene in a conversation that they had not been invited to? Are there ways that we can open up the possibilities around what and how science and medicine are created and constructed. And you, know, you, Dr. Peoples, were working on similar work and that conversation really opened up the possibility of Black Feminist Health Science Studies beyond my dissertation into something that could be shared and that I saw really enacted in other people's work as well. I just want to say I love that language of intervene in a conversation to which you were not invited, right? That feels like um, that feels like an ethic in some way, right? A, like a, a, it really is a, a kind of a mandate. Um, so thank you for that. Um, Omi Shere, do you want to hop in on this question? Absolutely. Um, it's great to be here. Thank you for including me. I'm uh, located in uh, Halifax, Nova Scotia in Canada on the traditional unceded territory of the Maliseet, whose ancestors along with the Mi'kmaq and Passamaquoddy nations signed peace and friendship treaties with the British crown in the 1700s. But it's important also to note that these treaties were signed around 140 years before the end of slavery in this region we now call Canada. And that it was enslaved African people who were used to dig out the roads and build much of the city, um, build much of Halifax um, during this time. I say this because I also want to acknowledge the longest, oldest Black community in Canada, which is also situated in Halifax, African Nova Scotian people, Black Scotians, um, who've been here throughout all of this time, uh, who are engaged and embedded in Indigenous communities themselves. Um, so uh, I, my work, because it's on blood <laughs> and blood donation and understanding the truth making that blood engages in, um, I need to begin with this piece around land and identity in, uh, in Canada. So um, I came to, well, you know, I came to Black queer diasporic analytics, actually, through my work on blood and blood donation. Uh, I was 
really intrigued and disturbed by um, the ways in which predominantly white gay and bisexual men and queer communities in Canada were at, um, engaging in active, activist movements to um, have gay blood included uh, to break the, the ban and blood donation of um, blood donors who, with men who have sex with men. And how in that work, um, there was simultaneously an erasure of um, black queer and trans people, but also a blame of black queer and trans people, right? That, you know, white queers who position themselves as just gay um, were somehow victimized by the HIV AIDS riddled bodies of black people. And so in my work, I obviously did draw on black feminism, specifically black Canadian studies and black health and science studies. And so um, as I was, I completed my PhD and was working, um, and before I began working with Nicole on um, Black techno science here, continued to look at this work that was happening, which is how I came across Black feminist health science studies, <laughs> um, and thought about the ways in which I feel we were these were the same moment, right? Very similar moments, these intersecting um, conversations of race and gender and sexuality and class. And um, here I would add belonging and citizenship. So when thinking about Canada um, and you know these claims to multiculturalism and inclusion and um, tolerance, uh, it's important to identify and out, if you will, uh, the epistemic dilemma that continues to be made of blackness and of black people. And so that means thinking about, as I just said, historical black communities in Canada, that black people are actually in Canada. Um, so what does that mean around the narratives of Canada and welcoming, being welcomed? Uh, that slavery happened in Canada, so how, so slavery, was still happening in Canada even after the very first medical school opened in Canada, which is in 1824, and slavery ended in Canada in 1834. So what does that mean for how we even understand um, Black people, our bodies, and well-being? Um, <clears throat> and then thinking about blood as this thing you're never supposed to talk about, you're not supposed to see it, it doesn't exist, it should not exist outside of your body, and if it's coming out of your body, you can never speak about it out loud. <laughs> and so how, how can we trouble this um, kind of belief of objective blood, objective blood um, knowledge or truth making? Um, and I do that through the site of blood donation. And so how do, what do we know about ourselves uh, through blood and blood donation? How, if we are centering black, queer and trans people, how do we, what is made visible to us through the blood donation protocols? And how can we look back at blood donation, which began in Canada in 1940? And what can we learn there from how it's practiced today? So how were, um, narratives of safe blood constructed in 1940, and how are those similar to um, claims of safe blood today? And how does all of that, what does that mean for us as Black people uh, and as Black queers and as Black women um, when we think about our liberation, our well being, um, determinants of illness, and um, continued technologies of care? So, yeah, <laughs> I'll stop there. Absolutely, thank you. Lugo, do you wanna hop in and share here around your own connections to Black Feminist Health Science Studies? Sure, thank you. And good morning to everyone, <clears throat> excuse my voice. Um, yeah, I think I would just say too, I, uh, I was working on my doctoral project that I became clear um, that to make better sense of what I was trying to work through, I needed to be in conversation and be reading text by Black feminists, by Black feminist health science um, thinkers. And just even in, in, in Brazil on the ground, talking to Black women activists, some who identified as feminists, some who did not, they were giving me their perspectives, their theories, their understandings of the debates as they had seen them kind of playing out in Brazil. 
in the realm of reproductive health, right? And specifically this question of contraception and sterilization. And so I just found that I was not, the theories that I was reading weren't sufficient for thinking through the nuances that I was seeing in the field. And I think um, the thing I find really fascinating and wonderful about um, Black feminist thought is that Black women and, and thinkers are fascinating thinkers. And every time I would feel like I had landed somewhere, I'd find a text that already thought through that and had pushed it further. So there's a way that it, it continues to sharpen um, my analysis and makes me really work hard. And I appreciate that push. So um, that's, yeah, that's what I'll say about how I kind of came into the scholarship and how I, I'm trying to get it to show up more in my work. Thank you. Absolutely. Ade. Hello, everyone. Um, and uh, thank you to the organizers for inviting me to this, to be in conversation with you all. What an honor. Um, so a lot of um, my journey is a little bit similar to Ugo. I felt that I, um, um, in, un in undergrad, certainly in also in graduate school, uh, Black feminist thought was fully underrepresented in the by that um, I was presented with. And so I came to Black feminist thought through my research and through this need to find um, thinkers that were thinking through the same questions that I was thinking through. Um, I think being both um, a clinician and an anthropologist, um, Black Feminist Health Science Studies is where I feel at home. It allows me to present all the sides of my work, the clinical, the, the scholarly work, the activism in one space um, without having to compromise. So I'm excited about that. Um, with my work, most broadly, I feel like I'm at the intersections of medical anthropology, critical race theory, and science and technology studies. Um, and um, my first project was tracking um, uh, the Nigerian National Project of creating and really sustaining a modern state through the intervention on um, the very intimate but lived experience of childbirth and childbirth and reproductive processes being this indicator of success. And so for this work and thinking through childbirth and what it means to um, not be able to have children or what it means to have a death occur during the process of childbirth, I really um, felt like engaging with African women writers that African fiction was super helpful. So that was my entree into Black feminist thought, engaging with um, Flora Nwapa, Bucci Emecheta, Sefi Ada, um, uh, Tsitsi Dagaremba, all of these Black feminist writers who were not thought of as feminist writers maybe in their time, but were really, really pushing us to think about how Black women are portrayed and, and portraying Black women in ways that they hadn't been portrayed before and specifically portraying African women in ways that they hadn't been portrayed before. So um, that was my entree. And then, and then I kind of moved back over to um, Black American feminist thought. And, um, and I remember Ugo and I were at a, an STS, a 4S conference, and we were just thinking like, wouldn't it be amazing if everyone here was thinking about Black feminist thought and doing this work? And then Moya, Bailey, and Whitney Peoples pop up and, <laughs> and this group is, this collective is go ongoing and we were just so excited to join. So I think it really is a space where um, we can think through ideas about Blackness, gender, health, how they're reinforced, how they're deployed, how they're resisted. Um, in, in struggles for health and well-being. And so I feel like it, it, it is a space that really speaks to the work that I'm doing. I'm happy to be here. Thank you. I'm gonna to shift to uh, Nicole, but before I do, for folks who have just joined, I wanna share the question again. So we're talking right now, and we're asking each of the panelists to speak to what is Black Feminist Health Science Studies to them, um, and to share a little bit about how their scholarship, how their practice relates to or connects to Black Feminist Health Science Studies. So we'll turn it over to Nicole. Hi everyone, I'm so grateful to be here with you. Uh, so 
Black feminist health science studies is what I've been trying to do and think since I entered post-secondary education, you know, engaging with Black feminist theory to try to understand my life and, and also, uh, you know, things not only in an academic sense, but interventions around health and vaccines specifically. And we, I know, are also grateful to uh, Dr. Peoples and Dr. Bailey for bringing us together under this rubric of Black Feminist Health Science Studies. And for me, this is really a practice of honoring and recognizing Betsy and Lucy and Anarka and, you know, all these other many non-consensual formulas of modern gynecology, as we note on this new site that Dr. Bailey has put together. Uh, you know, it's seeing their names alongside those of Dr. Susan Moore and Regis Porchinsky Paquette and Ashanti Riley and the hundreds of other missing and murdered young Black women living in this silent pandemic of gender-based violence in the Caribbean and indeed globally only amplified by the COVID-19 pandemic. And for me, it's really tracing the connections among these multiple processes and shared logics that co-constitute the systems that enable um, these state failures and facilitate the violence to which these Black women were and continue to be subjected to, not least of which are the media and our medical establishments. And so in tracing these connections, uh, the promise of Black feminist health science studies for me is a transformed relationship between our lives as Black people and these systems of settler colonial genocide, violence, uh, state neglect, medicine, science and technology, the list goes on. Um, and new, tech, new ontologies to think Blackness and care both and ultimately reinvent these terms of knowledge, techno-scientific and otherwise. I really, um, I just appreciate all of this. I mean, as, as I was thinking, I was thinking, how would I answer this question, right? Would I be able to add anything to this that, um, that you all weren't already going to say? But as I'm listening to each of you, I keep thinking to myself, Black Feminist Health Science Studies is a kind of radical permission right? It's a permission to like think beyond disciplinary boundaries, to connect, to like, I mean, part of the way that um, that I came to this work and, and was so grateful to have Moya and to be connected to Moya is hearing repeatedly that the work that I was doing didn't fit neatly in the boundaries of uh, science and techno science studies or feminist health studies, or that something always needed to be shaved off um, in order to make it fit. And so being able to uh, connect with Dr. Bailey, there was a kind of radical permission to say, well, actually we can just make our own category. It can be this whole other way um, so that we don't lose really important pieces of this lens that we need to think about black women and justice and health. And so I just, and, and hearing you all talk through that um, just really, I think amplifies that for me that it is a kind of radical permission. And I think that that matters a lot. We need radical permission, especially when we are working in higher ed um, and in formal academic spaces that um, that are often looking to try to constrain and constrict. Um, I want to just open up space. We have other questions, but are there ways that things that someone has said has sparked something that you want to take a moment to respond to, things that you want to highlight so that we don't lose track of as we move through our time together? I wanted to bring to the fore just what you were just speaking to, not shaving off pieces of ourselves in terms of doing this work, and that there's a real attention to care in our work, and that that is a feminist ethic that is sometimes associated with women, and I don't mean that in a derogatory sense of the way that women get really pushed into being caretakers, I mean that in the way our connection to one another is about extending who is in our community of care and how our own research collaboration and the process of coming together is another way of extending care. And I know we'll talk a bit towards the end about like 
our students, but I definitely felt like part of our coming together and collaborating, both in terms of creating the syllabi, which Nicole, Ugo, and I did together uh, for our courses that led up to the symposium was also a way that we were anticipating or articulating our care for ourselves and then ultimately our students in this really strange pandemic time. There's more that we can do when we do it together than if we do it separately. And it's also wonderful to see the, the pairs of collaboration even within the constitution of the collective. Like I know Nicole and Omi Shere have worked together, Ugo and Ade have worked together, Whitney and I have worked together. So that there's a lot of potential for collaborations that in our specific disciplines are not necessarily celebrated or understood as being important. That part of this for us is about the process, not just the science. The process is just as important as the uh, scholarship that we're producing. Dr. Bailey, I think you have set us up beautifully actually to move right to thinking about collaboration. Um, and I, you know, our main question here is what kind of collaborations do you want the Black Feminist Health Science Studies Collective to foster? Um, but I'm just gonna throw a little bit of a curveball in there so y'all bear with me. I think also, and you've just done this Moya, if there is space to speak to how is Black Feminist Health Study, Science Studies already a model for what ethical, productive, generative, transformative collaboration can look like? Um, so either or both of those but spend a little time perhaps talking a bit about collaboration in the collective. That's you, Dr. Bailey, if you have other things that you want to add there. I'll happily add some more. <laughs> one, of the, one of the things we've talked about is just the potential for doing work that is truly multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary what happens when the sciences and the humanities talk to each other more and not just through uh, individual people. So uh, as, as Ade told us, uh, she's someone who is living that intersection in terms of her own life as a practicing clinician and also an, a medical anthropologist. And I want us to also think about what a creative lab practice might be that encapsulates that. Is there room for a humanities science, social science lab that does the kind of multidisciplinary research that gets to the questions of our time? Uh, one thing that we've discussed pre-pandemic was just the limited amount of research on fibroids, particularly in, in Black communities, and wondering what would happen if research on fibroids was actually taken up by people across different spectrums. As somebody who is connected to or approaching that issue from a humanist perspective, what would happen if we were working in collaboration with scientists who and medical doctors who are also thinking about that issue from the beginning and really trying to think about what it is a, about the way our institutions are set up that prohibit or make it very difficult for those kinds of collaborations to take place. Uh, one of the things that Whitney and I discussed in our uh, time at Emory as graduate students was the physical distance between the humanities and the sciences and the School of Public Health. There's a literal bridge between those spots on campus. And I think that best encapsulates just the divide that is both figurative, figurative and then also literal between these uh, different disciplines. So I really see and hope that 
our collaborations can help make that uh, bridge a little bit less real and that we can actually uh, connect more across those, those disciplinary uh, boundaries. Absolutely, thank you. Omi Sheree, what would you add to this conversation around collaboration? Um, thank you. You know, I was thinking about um, the ways in which incoherence really kind of drove me to um, this piece around Black Core Studies or Black Core Diasporic Analytics and Black Feminist Health Science Studies for what you what you were all just saying, right? A way, a place to find home or to find um, to find oneself. And so when I think about collaborations, I think about some of the kind of day-to-day -day things that we do that we've already collaborated in, in terms of, um, you know, Nicole and I are working on a book uh, and for a variety of reasons, right? Like a new job, moving across the country, the pandemic, racial violence, <laughs> you know, we've um, slowed down, you know, this process with the book, but we've still been committed to it and supporting each other and checking in and really coming, um, uh, shifting our plan. Uh, but nowhere in that conversation was there, should we let it go? It was just like, no, no, we'll, we'll respond um, uh, to what's needed in this moment at this time to make sure we continue to move it forward. Um, and I'm working with another member of the Black Feminist Health Science Studies, uh, Nahal Alhadi, um, and we've been working on um, collaborative writing practices, and so the ways in which to be supportive of, you know, writing and trusting in your work, and especially if it feels to exist in between the spaces of um, recognition, <laughs> right? So how, how do you do this? Uh, and so it's allowed me then in our own book project to offer, you know, support to our contributors. How can I support you in, you know, in the writing and, you know, working together so we can work collaboratively for the book project. But the other piece I enjoyed, I think it was last fall, we had a Zoom call. Um, and just kind of talking about what was happening in our ideas and our dreams and we were thinking, oh, we should do um, a syllabus together or a course together, we should do these things. And it was at that moment I was, cause I just started in this new senior research position at Dalhousie and I was like, oh, I have to research in medicine in Canada and Canada doesn't collect data on black people. Canada likes to pretend black people aren't here. And so how do I do that? How do I, you know, look for black people in medical records and in medical systems that don't that can't see or oversee black people. And um, Moya <laughs> uh, generously was like, look for yearbooks. And so there was a way in which uh, just kind of feeling stuck, right? So these, you know, what do I do? How do I, you know, should I even do it, right? This, these pieces. So those, those like kind of speak to, you know, what our day-to-day -day academic lives are like. Um, but the other piece is also about reading and thinking and, um, you know, working in communities. So because my research chair is situated in African Nova Scotian communities, it's named for an African Nova Scotian man, the chair. Um, I've been thinking about how does collaboration work across these borders of the institution um, and how in the faculty of medicine do I bring in my training in humanities and social sciences. Um, and that, that, the way that I've seen things roll out here have really, um, in the space, right, that I'm also a participant in, have actually helped me think um, more broadly in terms of how, how I do this in this role um, and thinking about how to bring folks in uh, to the Black Feminist Health Science Studies uh, piece. Uh, I, it, it, it absolutely is centered in care and all of the ways and all the radical ways we can and understand care in these moments. Um, and it's the kind of uh, care um, that can support your research, even if you don't fully, if others don't fully understand it, but also support your well being. Um, and that's uniquely black. <laughs> it's uniquely black feminist, it's uniquely black queer. And um, uh, continue to expand on those uh, those types of collaboration are um, 
are, are, the, are the things that I'm absolutely excited about. I love it. I'm already hearing things about the process, but also rethinking what constitutes productivity and, and what, what constitutes appropriate areas for collaboration and connection. So again, I, for me, this kind of radical permission to rethink, to reimagine what these spaces can look like. Ugo, we are talking, and just again, uh, to restate the question, we are talking about um, what kinds of collaborations that folks want to see um, the Black Feminist Health Science Studies Collective foster, but also I think as both Moya and Omishure have spoken to, the ways in which the um, collective is already a model for rethinking um, collaboration. Yeah, thank you. Um, I would just add, um, you know, I think the syllabus and how the creation of a syllabus amongst ourselves, right, and how that um, also produced, at least I felt it was a, a way to produce a space for the students um, that allowed them freedom and openness to think in ways that weren't constrained by, um, that weren't constrained by some of the other ways in which we create syllabi and, and, and produce spaces for learning. Um, and also a means for them to connect and also start to build collaborations amongst themselves. And I think just the kind of permission to create the spaces that we want. I think um, Adil and I have expressed several times our frustrations with certain conferences um, and needing and wanting to figure out a way to just build create a space for us to be in conversation with people we wanna be in conversation who are um, working towards similar aims um, where this isn't just a kind of intellectual gymnastics for them, but this is actually tied to people's actual lives and fights for liberation. So um, I think I would like to see more of that, um, us feeling like we can make and create these intentional healing spaces. I'd like to, and maybe this is a selfish desire, but <laughs> more productive collaborations with um, or between scholars, thinkers, artists, activists, community, um, community workers, folks that are on the ground, agitators. Um, that's what I would like to see more of and I'm already starting to see. I love Ugo that I heard earlier both Moya and Omishori are talking about the care ethic in the collaboration, but I heard you specifically use the language of healing, that the collaboration itself is a healing space and a healing practice. Um, and I just want to name that because I think that's really powerful. And it is it is absolutely not the way that I was trying to think about collaboration in, in the academic sense or in any professional sense, to be honest, even outside of academia. So I think um, collaboration as healing practice is, is really powerful and really important to highlight. Adeola. Yeah, I think that last point about healing is so important. I mean, I agree with much of what's been said about this shared investment and shared stakes and this ethic of care. Um, what I think is unique and what is exciting to me about Black Feminist Health Science Studies is this orientation to the community and so I look forward to this sort of praxis component. I'm really excited about like, um, I think Moya was talking a little bit about what would it look like to have um, the clinical, the, the um, social scientific, the humanistic all working together in the space um, to, um, to treat uh, uh, medical diagnoses or to reconsider how we even think about diagnoses and what health looks like and what health um, uh, um, striving for a healthy body should it look like for different people. So that's exciting to me. Um, so when I think about BFHSS, I think about what can we, what can we do together, what we can build together, what can we create together with community. Um, I, I want to shout out Dr. Um, Monica McLemore, who is a professor and um, reproductive health researcher at UCSF. And she was recently on this um, uh, podcast, Black Feminist Rants. And I just love the way that uh, she framed what 
it means to do work grounded in community. Um, and it's not always about, uh, you know, making um, community members co-authors in our work, but asking what is a meaningful end for them? So what would it look like for them um, to get something out of this engagement? because maybe the aspiration isn't academic and maybe there's some sort of aspiration that's um, otherwise helpful to them. And so really thinking carefully about what community partnership looks like, what um, mutual respect looks like and making sure our research is always responsive to that. And so I'm looking forward to um, my, my next project, really engaging community at the earliest stages. Um, and engaging what are the problems that the um, that the majority women that I work with um, find the most important to them and seeing what we can do um, to further those goals. Um, I, I also need to shout out One Love Black Community, which is um, a, an organization started by Asmara Gebre, who is a, um, Black and Latina midwife at um, San Francisco General Hospital. And she created this organization to show up for Black birthing people in San Francisco. And I feel like it embodies BFHSS in action. It is holding, it is centering Black women. It is supporting each other. Um, it's real time responding to community needs, uh, serving, acting, demanding, healing together. Um, I learned so much from this diverse group of community leaders. We have midwives, doctors, uh, public health nurses um, who have all come together and, 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 and the um, sort of birthing community of San Francisco has also joined this work and come together to, to think about um, how best we can um, improve black maternal health. So I like that that space is this sort of space of praxis and hoping for that to build into something um, uh, uh, even bigger, like a lab or a physical space in which the, the, there can always be this sort of interdisciplinary um, um, work. So yeah, that's what I think about when I think about collaboration. I just wanna say, I love the um, shout out citational practices of this panel today. Um, so please, can we keep them coming? Um, I really appreciate that. Nicole. So I, um, like many of you have said, I'm really interested in thinking about transcending disciplines. And in addition to that, I want us to think about radical relationality in a transnational sense. So really expanding beyond the US centric focus on techno science and black feminism and integrating uh, diasporic black feminisms into our analyses I know this is something that we do in our syllabi and teaching. I want us to continue to think about and drive conversations with MDs about medical education reform and specifically on medical school admissions reform, you know, really recognizing, of course, the racist and sexist beliefs that have informed the Flexner report that continues to be heralded in many circles um, as, you know, the standard. And this is not just in the United States, it's absolutely in Canada as well. And I want us to continue this type of joy making in terms of our collaboration in teaching. So that's something that really brought me so much ease and joy this term as Moya has mentioned. And you know, I remember several years ago at an NWSA meeting, I don't know if you remember this Moya, but we began, we met to begin discussing the uh, then dream of this collective and, and then uh, the still dream of having a writing retreat with all of us where we could you know, collectively pursue this work of integration. And at that time, I was less confident in this possibility of reimagining our engagements with science and, and with physicians and with biomedicine and with care. And I think after some time, this collective has changed that. And I'm really grateful for the possibility to be here and be in conversation with you all across these years. 
because it has shown me that just coming together is a way of reimagining care, is a way of reimagining our engagement with science, right? And not only thinking, as, as one of you said at the beginning of this uh, panel, that you know we're giving ourselves permission to enter these conversations without seeking it. And I think that I've really shifted how I'm understanding our relationship to these fields just by being in conversation with you all. So I think you've all you've all said it all coming coming at the end. I don't really have that many more things to add, but I just want to second everything you've all said. I will say that each time one of you adds something to the conversation, it, there is something new and something that wasn't there before. So I just I just want to affirm that um, that that there is no getting to the end, and it's been said. Um, I appreciate that. I want to open up space before we shift a little bit um, and just make room for people to respond to one another. Are there things that you that someone has said that you really want to come back to or you want to highlight before we shift to thinking about um, the collective and the relationship to medicine and science? I just wanted to say, you know, um, when the conversation uh, started about working collectively on a syllabus at the time, um, I, I no longer teach in the humanities and social sciences. I teach in the faculty of medicine to medical students. And so I had no idea what that would look like. Is it the 12 week course? Is it, you know, this thing? So I, I didn't participate. Um, also new job over busy. <laughs> um, and so when I, you know, I did teach in medicine this year, it was three lectures of one hour to, I don't know how many students who then went off to tutorials that I had no participation in. And so at the time I was, as I was doing this, I was like, oh, I wonder how that syllabus is going. And, you know, what do you do in an hour when, um, you know, the Dalhousie, Dalhousie Medical School opened in like the 1880s. Um, but this is the first time there was dedicated lectures and material on black health and black populations. Um, and so, where do you start with that? So I was, I missed the conversation, but then when Nicole just said, you know, thinking uh, like radically across disciplines, how do we do that with our teaching when teaching in the humanities looks different, I'm realizing <laughs> now, than teaching in med school. When I'm in teaching professional competencies in year two, right, that's not necessarily interwoven throughout, you know, um, you know, uh, I don't know, anatomy lab or, you know, like, you know, hematology or obstetrics, right? Like it's not, it's not currently woven through those, you know, real areas of medical education. So it was just, I was, you know, is that a site of collaboration and what would that look like and how would we engage it? Anyway, that's just something I was thinking of. <laughs> well, I love that too, because I think it highlights, um, what it means to try to move across some of the disciplinary boundaries that we have just talked about, but also how collaboration might be a site that makes that possible, that enables that less perhaps for the institution, but more for the individual scholar, practitioner, thinker, right? That like, as you make that divide. Um, so I work in a center for teaching and learning and like, I'm regularly trying to work with instructors around how do you move through different teaching and learning environments, but there isn't always support for that. So I think having thinking about the collaborative as a space um, that is not just about research support, but also like pedagogical, like how do we teach this thing? How do we move this out to students? I think that's really powerful and, and like a critical thing to name. It's a, I think it's a big reason why we don't see more of the transfer of information from one disciplinary space to another. So I think these are, are great places to, you all have spoken to each a little bit being in conversation with science and medicine, either through thinking about teaching and pedagogy and what courses look like and curriculum looks like and when training happens, but also in terms of thinking about the kinds of organizations that you're working with or the kinds of folks that you would hope to work with one day. So I'd like to open up space to talk specifically about that. Um, for folks to name here, what is it that you want science and medicine to learn from the work of Black Feminist Health Science Studies? Dr. Bailey, do you want to start us off there? Do you have some things you'd like to start us off sharing? Sure. I am definitely thinking about 
uh, what Ami Shire just offered us, which is, are there opportunities for collaboration across these divides? And how do we get uh, the work that we're doing not to be seen as extra or on top of or separate and addendum to the real work of medical education? And that sort of integration to me might be best served if it starts at the undergraduate level or even before. You know, there needs to be an opportunity for young people who are thinking about medicine to see themselves and see what it is that they are, why they might be interested in medicine actually supported and affirmed. I've heard too many times that students get turned off because the science and the, I guess the, what is considered the appropriate or real content of medical education doesn't seem to speak to them. Mm -hmm. And uh, there doesn't seem to be an opportunity to address disparities until you are very far into your program. And then again, that that work is considered extraneous or again, on top of the already demanding academic expectations of medical school. So the degree to which we can come up with curriculum that bridges those divides, I think would be a really important effort. And I, you know, I'm curious to uh, Ade, how you see this playing out as somebody who's you know, really done that work your, yourself. Yeah, I mean, um, I think that this is such an important question for, as, for someone like me who, you know, I spend the majority of my time right now in clinical spaces, um, this comes up daily in my work, how to make, um, the contributions of Black feminist thought central to the work that we do, especially um, in the sort of urban underserved environment that um, that my um, hospital and clinic system um, uh, exists within. Um, and the question that I find myself asking my colleagues and um, sort of the ways in which I um, I am trying to constantly apply pressure is um, how will this intervention, QI project, community engagement idea, whatever it is, impact the most marginalized people in societies, and how and and even further, how were they involved in the initial phases of this? And so I think this this always recentering of black women, of queer people, of trans people, um, of undocumented people um, is important. And, that, and that's the, the sort of work of putting the social justice into the medicine. I think that I love the idea of really trying to engage people in this work at the undergraduate stages. And I think that so much of who gets into med school um, and who gets space, uh, who gets hired in medical uh, schools, who gets to teach, who gets to form the minds that will then take care of Black people. So much of that is already in existence. And so the intervention also has to be on the level of um, the schools themselves, the faculty, the deans. Um, I sit on admission committees because I think it's so important to rethink how we decide who gets into med school. We've already proven that standardized testing is uh, um, biased and disadvantages people of color, and yet we still hang our hats on it for some reason. It doesn't correlate. We've already proven that it doesn't correlate with clinical um, um, with with clinical performance when you become a resident, and yet we still use it as a rubric to measure students. And it's it's that deterrent that uh, that. Um, um, deters people who would be perfectly wonderful doctors, clinicians, uh, nurses, 
um, midwives because of these numbers that don't actually have any, we've just sort of fetishized them, they have no weight. And so I think it's really important to, to always be applying that kind of pressure in all of these sort of spaces all the way up. And that translates into the care that um, people receive in these clinical spaces as well. Thank you, Ade. I wanna open it up also um, to other panelists. I'm sure Ugo, if you all have, and Nicole, if you have things to add here. I also wanna highlight um, right before I hand it off here that a question has come in also about um, thinking around healthcare professionals beyond medical doctors. Um, and in particular, this person has flagged nursing um, and thinking about nurses as the largest group of healthcare professionals and where they, where they fall, where the curriculum to train nurses falls in the conversation that we're happening, having now. So I wanted to flag that as something that's come up in the question. I just wanted to interject then to say that we do have nurses as part of the Black Feminist Health Science Studies Collective. And as we can imagine, they are pretty overwhelmed. I mean, again, this is a really trying time. So in thinking about the voices that we are able to highlight in this moment, we also are definitely deeply connected to who are the people on the day-to-day -day who are administering care at all levels of the medical industrial complex as it exists currently. Thank you, Maria. Uh, yeah, sorry, I, is it okay? No, absolutely, go ahead, Ugo. Um, and maybe I'm a bit of a pessimist, but um, I think I, I took the question as uh, not so much what we want them to learn from our work, I think we've been pretty clear um, what we'd like for them to learn from our work. And I think it's upon the institutions of science and medicine and those who are withholding them, um, sustaining them to decide if they want to learn from our work, right? Um, because I, I just, I, I see it as like a, a, a refusal, like the, just a refusal to actually learn, to take up the work, engage it in um, meaningful ways to, um, yeah, so I, I, I guess I'm less interested even in whether there's, whether I want them to learn anything. So I'm not sure that they are committed and they want to. Um, and so, you know, Nigerians like to say, it'll be by force. And so it's not by force. I'm not gonna force you to learn this. I'm not gonna force you to care about us. So I, I guess I'm more interested in then what does that mean for us? Um, how do we, and that's why I'm really excited by the Black Feminist Health Science Studies Collective and whatever I'm already seeing just in terms of, um, and of course other work that folks are doing. I mean, um, Adiola has spoken about One Love Community. Um, there's, I'm so bad with names, but the midwife in Florida who just got her midwifery school certified, right? So there, there are other models for us um, to be able to create our own spaces and shape what that looks like and how we do actually take up the what we've produced and our concerns and thread it through because it's not this is not um it's not rocket science so um yeah that would be my i guess the question is to science medicine and health do you all want to learn from our work we've been pretty generous it's out there it's not hidden um it's just a matter if you actually want to engage and i just think there's a refusal so they need to face that um and then we can go from there uh, yes, that is everything. I just want to name that because, especially if I think about what you all are saying about the nature of collaboration in the collective, right? That it is a healing space, a just space, an ethical space, a space marked by care. And that becomes difficult if you're having to do this work of trying to convince people and drag people over and prove yourself and prove your uh, value and your validity. Um, so I just thank you for naming that. Um, yeah, I appreciate that. Omi Sheree, were there things that you wanted to add here? And, and Nicole also. Um, you know, I wanted to, all of that. This is so great. I wish, I wish we were um, in the same space at a table with food, you know, babies and elders, you know what I mean? Just like kind of like space, music, <laughs> that space. Um, but I, I want to shout out to um, uh, Muriel uh, and 
Do and Jomowo, my apologies, and Jomowo, uh, who was a Cameroonian refugee and a mother of three who died March 9th in a hospital in Quebec um, after having been given penicillin uh, despite telling the staff that she was allergic to it. So she recorded herself asking for help um, to be transferred to another hospital. Um, Cameroonian community came together and got her transferred um, and she succumbed. So I when I read this question, what do you want science and medicine to learn from our work? I want them to learn, I want them just to stop killing us. Like I want them to stop expediting our death. I want them to stop um, uh, adding to the daily harms that we engage in. And so when I started as the James R. Johnson Chair in Black Canadian Studies in the Faculty of Medicine, it's, a, it's an interesting chair that it rotates through various faculties in the university. It was the first time this chair had been positioned in the Faculty of Medicine. And I'm the first queer person to hold the chair. And they were like, what does Black Studies have to do with medicine? So as Ugo was saying, they were like, oh, we have research. And we do have research in Canada. We may not have the, the, the breadth of data that the US and the UK have, but we have research. But still, it was like, why are you here? I don't, I don't want to talk to you. I don't have time for you. Um, after Mr. George Floyd, Ms. Regis uh, uh, Kaczynski Paquette, um, when people started taking a knee um, and, uh, and COVID and the data coming out around COVID, then there was this, this push, right? Oh, we need to meet with um, Omi Shire. So I had um, the great pleasure of working with Dr. Ani Norum, who's at the University of Toronto. She's a family doc and a public health um, doc. She's also a member of BFHSS, just hasn't had time to like be more active. But we're working on a Black Health Education Collaborative for Canada um, that looks beyond just medicine, right? So all areas of health professional professions and working with the Medical Council of Canada and the, uh, the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons. Um, but the Medical Council of Canada really to identify learning objectives that all med students need to know in order for them to be doctors. So learning objectives around Black people, Black populations, and Black health. On one hand, you're just like, eh, it's the work that you have to do for systems to, to make sure the system has this. It's also an intervention. But the other piece um, is holding these spaces for Black med students, um, you know, because it's important to note, like the National Black Medical Students Association of Canada just formed in 2019. Uh, at my own university, the Black Medical, uh, the Dalhousie Black Medical Students Association just formed this past January, right? There are universities in Canada that have said to Black medical students, it would be reverse racism or um, uh, segregation if you, you know, to give you permission to set up a Black Medical Students Association, right? Like this is, these are the real conversations in Canada around this continual epistemic dilemma they find of Blackness, right? And so while I'm doing this institutional kind of EDI, stop hating on Black people, stop trying to kill us work, I'm also really committed to this work with Black physicians and Black students that is housed in radical activism. <laughs> Right. So it's like, okay, yeah, you're, you know, so when I say to black students, when I'm teaching them, say when I say to med students, you know, you're gonna have black patients. And some of them are like, really? You're gonna have black patients. You're gonna have black colleagues. You're gonna have black, you know, residents. Um, I'm also saying to black students, there's a way that we can organize out of black feminist activism, out of black queer activism that provides for us the kind of care, communities of care, um, to help us deal with these um, violent anti-Black racism and misogyny and misogynoir and homophobia in the workplace. And so it's, it is this, the, this bind of doing this systemic work that could be soul leeching while also doing this work that's about, um, you know, how do we overthrow the system and create something different? So I want science and medicine to stop killing us. Yes, yes. I would like oh. to add to that as well, uh, just to, you know, I absolutely agree in terms of this refusal, this willful ignorance 
Uh, but I see that not merely in terms of a refusal to engage with our work, but to recognize this work as the antithesis of care making in so many senses, right? Uh, you know, Black Feminist Health Science Studies is where the, where science and the systems that uphold science, so often anti-Blackness, patriarchy, white supremacy collide. And I want medicine and science to learn that there is little utility in overdrawing this distinction between uh, scientific objectivity and certainty and Black ways of knowing and also refusing that supposed objectivity. You know, as Catherine McKittrick says, we are not outside science, we are science. And so I think through this work, I want healthcare professionals, so that includes physicians, nurses, public health professionals, health policy makers, to recognize and take seriously the social, historical, and increasingly economic context out of which their work and the biotechnologies with which they work emerge and why that matters. So, you know, recognizing that those things are not in the past and recognizing that their mandate to be socially accountable to the public has to mean that they are explicitly anti-racist and justice oriented and not merely culturally competent is this language that's used within medical schools. Absolutely. There's a, there's a question that's come up that I think is relevant here um, before we shift a little bit. And it is, this, it's a question about helping folks who are working in clinical settings, radical black folks uh, is the question states who are working in clinical settings. So technicians, nurses, PAs, doctors, what are, the, what are some strategies or some ways to help connect those folks with people who are working in an activist context, in an academic context, in a community context? Um, do you all have thoughts about how to connect people so that they can have the kind of generative, ethical collaborative spaces and impactful collaborative spaces that you all are naming, um, both as what you're trying to create, but also is what's really needed to see some sort of shift or change? I definitely think, what, oh, <laughs> go ahead. Well, I just wanted to put a plug for the uh, collaboratory, the conference that we're going to be holding um, in May. And um, I think Ugo will talk a little bit more about it, but um, this is one of the spaces that we want um, to bring clinicians and across the spectrum of clinical work and um, scholars and activists and community workers to come and share space and think through these questions. Um, that we've raised today and um, and also just to hold each other and be in community with each other. And um, as we've all talked about, practice this ethic of care. So um, it, that's that's one way place where <laughs> where we can we can come together. Hugo, do you want to speak to that and then Moya? Oh, sorry. Yeah, so it's May uh, 14th to the 16th, and we will have a link that um, we will share in the chat at some point. I have to figure out how to do that. Um, um, but one way is we have these lightning talks for what's left to apply for, which you can do like a five minute talk about your work, uh, whether it's community work, whether it's artist, artistic work, um, professional work. And it's a way to be in this space, engage with others, let people know what you're doing, um, like I was saying, just kind of holding space for ourselves um, and hopefully building connections and networks that can go forth, right? So not just that weekend, but, um, you know, onward. And we hope to be able to continue to do this kind of work and hold this kind of space for ourselves moving forward. And thank you and to Sophia, know. who's already put a link in the chat and go right ahead, Dr. Bailey. Yes, I wanted to add that I see our work, our collective and collaboration with other collectives that are trying to make connections along the line of practitioners, activists, community organizers. So I'm thinking about BEAM, the Black Emotional and Mental Health Collective founded by Yolo Akili. I'm also thinking about Incusin which is a national organization for queer, trans, uh, people of color therapists who are trying to make 
connections across that that realm. There are just many opportunities. Uh, there, there's also um, black girl therapists who are trying to make sure that black women have access to uh, the mental health care that they need by uh, black practitioners. So there are multiple realms that are being touched by this black feminist impetus, even if not so much in name, like the uh, Black Feminist Health Science Studies Collective. So I'm really interested to see those groups being able to come together uh, and address any uh, gaps that there might be, depending on you know where where we overlap and where we can perhaps extend our reach. Thank you. So I want to flag that there are um, a number of questions that are in the chat that are great questions, um, but I'm going to pull moderator's prerogative. And I want to ask this question about students and teaching, because as someone who focuses on teaching in her day-to-day -day work, I really believe and know, I see day-to-day -day that pedagogy is power. And so I, I love to hear, um, we don't have a lot of time left, but given the role that teaching and students played in today and us being here in this space, um, I would really love to hear about the relationship between your students and your scholarship and what you want them to take away from this and the ways in which you want them to be empowered by this work. Um, so I'd love to just hear from, from a few folks in our time left about um, the relationship to students. I can start here just to say Please I do. was so, I'm so proud of my students. Uh, I, I am just thrilled by the podcast that I hope you will listen to uh, following our break. Uh, they have done a phenomenal job of researching and uh, getting to the crux of what some of the issues are within different areas of the medical industrial complex and have been very vulnerable and forthcoming in terms of their own experiences that relate to some of these broader oppressive issues that actually undergird our healthcare system. And their willingness to go there, I think has everything to do with the generative scholarship produced by the collective. Students read a lot of your work before, uh, before today as they were preparing their, uh, preparing their podcast episodes. So I am, again, just in awe of what is possible if the arena is opened and, and made available to students to go uh, where they want to in terms of their own educational interests. Are there others who wanna to speak to the role of students? Yeah, I try to remind my students um, that they're teaching me, right? Like it's not just, I think sometimes they still think that um, their experiences, their insights, their perspectives are not, <clears throat> are not worthy of being expressed or shared. And so I try to, when they are vulnerable and they do share those perspectives and their experiences, I try to remind them that it's important that I'm learning with them. Um, that my pedagogy is changing and response in conversation with what they're showing me, teaching me, pushing me on. Um, and that I really appreciate um, their, their insights and their, their willingness to, to enter and, and struggle through some of the things that are coming up in, in, the, in, the, in the coursework and how they're pushing is being, or how their thinking is being pushed and what they're coming up with, what they're struggling with. Um, and so, yeah, I try to, I'm not sure if I'm always successful, but I try to at least um, remind them of how important they are in this production of knowledge. Absolutely. Omi Chere, Adeola, Nicole, are there things here that you would like to highlight or add about your students or about the role of teaching in this work? Uh, 
Um, you know, I've, um, whenever I'm teaching, I, uh, oh, is my, oh, there I, I thought my camera was turned off. It was strange. Uh, I really work to support the activist um, actions that students are already involved in and to make sure, and to make sure that they feel that reflected or engaged in the work that we are working with, right? And the items that we're working with. You know, ideally I want them to leave the classroom ready to tear down everything and start anew and create something different. <laughs> um, uh, and I always enjoy teaching uh, around health and science and medicine, then in a women's studies program, I've done it in, um, in other, uh, in other departments. Uh, to do the very thing that we were talking about, to, do, to disabuse ourselves of this idea um, that this work is colorblind, that it's subjective, that it's, that it's math. Right, or it's it's a it's an understanding of math that's very pedantic, right? That I really want them to say, yes, you can question the truth that blood tells you. Yes, you can question, you know, these things around reproduction. Yes, you can question, um, you know, just you know that somebody in a white coat can tell you in a white lab coat can tell you the truth about yourself, right? Be, like all of these things, and so, um, and as Ugo was saying, you know, when it when it's when it's amazing, right? Um, even when it's really difficult, in all of those moments, they're pushing you, right? They're pushing you to be like, oh, okay, that didn't work, or um, they didn't get what I was quite saying. And so I find it so self, um, self educative as well, right? It's, it's, I've not been in the classroom for a long time and I miss it, like I was this year, but I online, but I miss it. I miss those kinds of engagements that tug back and forth of, you know, we don't believe you. Okay, maybe we believe you. <laughs> and hopefully when they leave, oh, okay, maybe there's something here. So um, I, I, I think of, uh, of this experience and this relationship as one that hopefully incites radical change. Yes, thank you. Areola, are there things you would add here? I mean, I think I agree with much of what's been said. There's just so much. I, I think mostly um, I want students to be creative and to be critical. And I think um, when coming from a place of trying to be generative, um, that uh, we, we build the most together, but also to be critical of what has been taught to us because most of what has already been taught to us is taught from a white supremacist patriarchal frame. And so to just always be critical and that I, I think um, uh, the Black Feminist Health Science Studies um, Collective um, really um, embodies that kind of work. Um, and um, just, to, just to, to note again, um, these, the, the Black feminist, scholars that now um, run all the way through my work and that now um, are, you know, the fuel that I, um, that keeps me going throughout my clinical work, throughout these spaces that are predominantly white, that work wasn't um, presented to me in school. <laughs> and so it's so important to look outside the syllabi that are presented to you um, and to, to seek out work that really speaks to what you're doing. Nicole, are there things here that you would share too about how you think about teaching and your students in relation to the work of a collective? I think um, pretty much the same thing as I want science and medicine to learn or understand because I think, you know, as you just said, Adi, we're all living in and have grown up in this white supremacist world in which we come to understand science and medicine in certain ways that so often delegitimize our theory in the flesh to use Sherry Moraga and Gloria Anzaldua's term. But like Moya, I think I'm so inspired by my students because they're not refusing. They're so engaged and excited to learn and to question and to refuse these narratives. Uh, and I think too that it's important to emphasize here that 
I think some of you might resonate with this, but there's a way in which a lot of students enter the women and gender studies classroom and find their way there because of, you know, the way we're, we're studying the co-constitutive nature of feminism and gender and race and sexuality. And that really resonates with them. And they find the language to speak to the realities of their lives. And they enjoy learning feminist theory and history but many of my students also struggle with whether women in gender studies should be their major because what are they going to do with the woman in gender studies degree and, and a lot of this has to do with parental pressure as well but i think there's a way that black feminist health science studies really emphasizes to our students and parent figures that this work is integral to you know the seemingly objective realms of science and technology, which are inevitably and undoubtedly informed by society and so too can be informed by the radical change that we are already seeing our students and folks in this collective make. So I want my students to, you know, take that message home and to recognize that this is so much more than interesting, right, and, and relevant to their lives, but it's, it's, impactful. I think our conversations today have really shown that this work makes an impact into science and medicine. Uh, and there is a refusal to acknowledge that, I think, because of the way it unsettles science and medicine. Absolutely. I, I One thing that I want to name, and then I'd like to, to just do a quick practice here, but one thing I want to name is also, this work for this collective started when some of these folks were students. And I don't just mean graduate students, I mean in the undergraduate context. Ask Moya Bailey about that relationship to medicine and that other career track and that right that like these were things that people were thinking about as undergraduates, as grad students. So I think that's a powerful piece to name here that you all also know the power of the student position because it was also a productive place for you as you were thinking and reading beyond the syllabus. Um, and, and looking for something more. So I would like to read, there were three questions that were asked in the chat that did not get um, asked explicitly. So I'd like to at least read those and then offer you all a, a chance to just uh, share a final word before we go, but I wanna make sure that these three questions are shared. Um, so the first one is, as Black women, how do we research the way we have evolved and what has happened to our body, psyche, interaction with one another? How do we heal the divide between us? So that's one of the questions that was shared that we didn't specifically get to. The other two are, um, do you all see any ways in which technology can improve some of the issues that have come up in today's session? So we talked a bit about science and medicine, but this is a question specifically about thinking about um, technology in those spaces and beyond those spaces that may be productively leveraged by, um, by Black women, by Black folks, by Black feminist health science studies. And then finally, a question that was asked is, what did the panelists think about HBCU medical schools and health schools, allied health schools, um, fit into some of this conversation around changing um, medical education and being in conversation with science and medicine, particularly around questions of racial justice, gender justice, and equity. Um, so I will stop there, but I wanna turn it back over to the panelists to be able to, if you want to speak to one of those questions, by all means do. If you'd like to just share a parting word for today, I think that would be a nice way to end our time. And I'll start with Dr. Bailey and I'll move through that same order if folks wanna share something. Sure. I can speak a little bit to HBCUs and medical schools. One of the uh, unfortunate consequences of the Flexner Report is that there were at the time uh, six Black medical schools, and then because of the Flexner Report, that number went to two. And we have uh, just, as far as I'm, Meharry, um, Morehouse School of Medicine, who are now understood as the remaining uh, Black medical schools, although they do have students from you know, a, a wide variety of backgrounds. And I, I think there is potential for those institutions to do something different. And we've seen that, you know, in the construction of Morehouse School of Medicine, the creation of that school was specifically to help 
ensure the health of uh, people who might otherwise not be able to access care, uh, to train medical students who were designed, who were interested in giving back and serving in a more public health context. Uh, but as those things go, has the school been funded, you know, as well as some other medical schools? Uh, is there the same sort of prestige or idea about that? medical education, I'm not, I'm not so sure. But for me, I'm hopeful that with our collaboration, we are doing that work of changing how these institutions operate, that our collective uh, vision for what can, for what is possible within the intersection of both uh, science, medicine, technology, and health we're, we're doing that. And I want to leave with, you know, the one of the quotes that really inspired me was uh, from the Kambahi River Collective statement drafted by uh, Demita Frazier, uh, Barbara and Beverly Smith. And in that they say, you know, if Black women were free, it would necessitate the freedom of everyone else. Um, and that idea is so important to me because it really gets to the heart of what it is that we're trying to accomplish. And again, that collective was possible, was able to do what they did because they did it together. So I am really interested in what we do as a team versus what we can accomplish individually. Thank you. Homi Shire, do you have a word for us? Thank you. So yes, I wanted to end with blood the way I started. <laughs> um, you know, I think we all know that blood is performative and in my work, blood donation is also performative. It's this, you know, medical and social and uh, practice. And what I'm finding here are ways to continue to think through um, the various expressions uh, of blood. Uh, and blood donation uh, and the ways in which blood can be a metaphor and thinks through or offers us um, potentially uh, diverse and divergent modes of communication around self and around blackness and about um, black radical practices. Uh, it's something I'm still working on articulating, uh, but it is something I believe is achievable in there and something identifiable. So while it still feels kind of just outside of my grasp to place into words, um, when I think about the practices and the agents and the hematology, I'm wondering what we can learn about hemoafrophobia, if you will, while thinking about the various ways the blood shows up in our lives um, and who else but to, you know, to lead that thinking, but Black feminist, <laughs> Black queer folks, Black queer and feminist thought uh, in health and science studies. So blood will lead us in radical ways. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, I just wanted to thank the attendees for their questions. Um, I apologize that we can't get to them. And, um, more uh, expansive ways, but I think um, also just reminding ourselves that we have to every turn continue to divest ourselves from whiteness because I think there's ways in which we're all invested um, in it just because of the nature of the world and how it's been structured and how we are socialized and, and educated. So we have to constantly be pushing against our own investments in whiteness. And I think that that will help us to be able to heal um, and recognize the divisions that we have amongst ourselves, um, be able to create intentional spaces, uplift and, and then um, value our own modes of, of thinking, of, of producing knowledge, of understanding ourselves, um, and even what technology is, right? To the question of technology and whether it can be of service to us. Well, what, you know, I'd like to ask, like, what is technology? How are we understanding that? And, um, as a way to think about how then do we engage with it and how we can use it. Um, and just, yeah, I guess 
I always tell my students I want them to understand as we study and think about blackness, we have to also always think about medicine, the science, what we've thought of as medicine, the sciences, health and technology. And also to think those things, we have to also always be thinking blackness because of the ways that they're related and in conversation and co-constituting each other. So thank you. Ade. Thank you. Um, I, I, I'll just say briefly that I am so grateful to be in conversation with the other panelists and grateful to everyone who has joined, even though we can't see you. Um, and that for those coming to this space um, for the first time or early in their relationship to Black Feminist Health Science Studies, um, it really is a model for um, how to do research, practice, activism that, um, that both reveals and responds to the ways that race, gender, um, economic status, sexuality, all of these things that determine the wellness of our communities, um, unfortunately. And so um, I think that I'm really grateful to be having this conversation and, and um, excited for um, what everyone will go off and do after this conversation. And I hope, um, I hope everyone um, finds someone else to talk to about it or finds communities where they are in their, um, wherever space they are in their schools and their colleges and their communities and their medical schools and their clinical spaces um, to continue to talk about these um, problems and these issues. And, um, and then also to find a space for joy and creativity as well. Nicole. So I wanted to uh, just say a few words on that question about healing the divides between us. I think we are doing that right now. We are beginning to heal those divides by showing up and speaking in these black frequencies. You know, we're doing that work of intentional remembering of what Jackie Alexander calls deep forgettings that white supremacy facilitates. And it's often an, income, an uncomfortable place to be in, but there's so much inspiration and perspective around us from our black, queer and trans feminist foremothers whose courage and generosity have created a bridge for us so that we can rest and recharge to do and continue that work. So, yeah. You all are amazing. I am so happy that I got a chance to be a part of today, to listen to you all talk, to be a part of making some connections between what you shared. I want to end with uh, something that was shared in the questions, if possible, before I turn it back over to Elaine. Uh, a, a comment came in from someone who said, I'm an undergrad who's been discouraged by med school, but what's been said has given me hope that there are always other paths to providing radical comprehensive care. Um, that's powerful. And that's just from this 90 minute conversation that someone was able to be affirmed in that way and to walk away um, from this. So thank you all for what you are offering. Thank you to the folks who shared questions in the chat um, and who stayed on and listened today. This has been wonderful. Elaine, I will turn things back over to you. Thank you, Dr. Peoples. And thank you to our amazing panelists. I would like to remind everyone that we will now have a screen break until 3 p.m. Feel free to stay here and enjoy BFHSS collective member, Dr. Jalila Burel's Spotify playlist, Rest Your Eyes, Meditation Adjacent Music. Also feel free to follow the link to our other playlists, Relax, Relate, Release, and it's linked in the chat and on the BFHSS website. And you can read her full bio in the chat.